All right, we'll go ahead and get started as I'm sure a, a few more people will join. But I'm James Taylor from the Institute of Environmental Edu Research and Education at UNF. Many of you have probably uh, met me before or in my conservation bio class. Um, but we are hosting this event uh, with Beyond Plastic and we'll learn a little bit more about Beyond Plastic in just a moment. But a bit more about uh, our department is we host a variety of programs for um, all UNF students. So any major that you come from, we probably have a program for you including an honor society for students interested in environmental uh, careers and majors. We also have an environmental leadership program. Many of you have joined us for some of our Field Friday events where we explore environmental themed careers and visit places like White Oak. Um, and we also work on research projects uh, such as this one that's associated with the NOAA Marine Debris Grant. And to learn a little bit more about that, I'm gonna hand it over to the director of uh, Irie, uh, Dr. Erin Largo-White and Professor of Public Health. Hi, I'm Erin Largo-White. I'm a professor and I'm also the director of Irie, as we, as we say. Um, I'm one of the co-principal investigators for, on this research project, along with my UNF partner, who's here, Dr. Heather Trulove, who's in the Department of Psychology. We're working on this grant, this project, um, with four other scientists, researchers from Eckerd College in marine biology, um, environmental studies, and computer science, and we're all working together um, to make a change. So basically what this project is, is a two-year project funded by NOAA Marine Debris Program, and essentially we're working to reduce single-use plastic consumption and hopefully foster longer, long-term um, pro-environmental behaviors among coastal universities. So Eckerd College is down south on the west coast. We're northeast Florida in Jacksonville on the Atlantic. Um, and ultimately the goal of this research of this project is to reduce the generation of marine debris in those areas over time. Um, so the project, like I said, it's two years and we will integrate plastic reduction challenges, education, outreach initiatives to increase awareness to affect attitudes and beliefs, um, and ultimately encourage behavior change among the students at both campuses. Um, so the discussion today is hosted by Irie, and it's part of our outreach and education efforts. And yeah, that's it. Really looking forward to it. So thank you all for being here. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Largo White. And uh, as uh, she said, we host a number of outreach events, so we held another <clears throat> workshop that some of you attended in the past. This is our last one for this semester. We'll host some more in the spring, but we have one more cleanup scheduled for October 23rd. If you are interested in joining us, you can visit the website I just put in the chat to find that program as well as other programs, and you can learn more about those um, student opportunities. And speaking of student opportunities, um, while we're hosting this, the real person who put this together uh, is our student assistant, Erin, who many of you also know. Uh, and Erin is a student assistant working on this NOAA project, uh, but she is so much more than that, including a UN Millennium Fellow who will be hosting an event uh, on October 25th, and we hope to have that on the website very soon. Uh, maybe she can briefly discuss that, uh, but she's also the president of our Honor Society and um, so many more things. So. Erin's uh, a great person to know, and I'll turn it over to her to introduce herself and then our speaker. Hi, yeah, so my name is Erin um, Ogrodnik, and I'm a student, and I do a lot of programs um, with Irie, as um, James was talking about, and I'm excited to be working on these single-use plastic initiatives, and um, coming up on October 25th, we're going to be hosting an event on campus, which will be um, focused all about reducing um, single-use plastics specifically at UNF and um, taking student action. So 
Um, I'll be sending out more information about that in the coming few days here, but I wanted to go ahead and introduce um, our speaker for the evening, which is Alexis Goldsmith. Um, she is from Beyond Plastics, and Alexis is a grassroots organizer who grew up in Indiana and is um, an alumni of Indiana University um, from Bloomington. Before joining Beyond Plastics, she worked with the Hunger Relief for the food pantries for the Capital District and also served as the executive producer for the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, a grassroots radio news hour based out of the Sanctuary for Independent Media in Troy, New York. Uh, she worked closely with frontline communities facing um, waste incineration in New York's capital region. And while at the Sanctuary, she co-founded the Hudson Mohawk Environmental Action Network, a grassroots consortium promoting environmental justice and indigenous rights along the Hudson River. She is currently um, keeps pastured pigs, rabbits, and a garden in upstate New York. Um, and before this, she was telling me about her pigs and it was very exciting. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the torch over to Alexis. Thank you so much, Erin, for the uh, really wonderful introduction. So happy to be here tonight, and I hope that this will be an engaging presentation and that you will um, come away with it with a much different perspective on uh, plastics. So I've been asked to present to you some of the false solutions and also what students can do about uh, this problem. So uh, that is my wheelhouse. I am the National Organizing Director with Beyond Plastics. So I work with um, people on the ground and grassroots organizers working on this issue. And um, that's all I do every day. <laughs> so um, if you could enable screen sharing, I do have a presentation. Um, as I go through this talk, I want you all to think of yourselves as possible organizers also in this. Um, in this issue and um, just hold on with me because it is an intense presentation, but we're gonna talk about uh, what to do about it um, in the second half. You should have screen sharing capable. Yep, there you go. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so there's my email. Um, loading, 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 loading. Uh, Alexis Goldsmith at Bennington.edu. Um, Bennington College in Vermont is our fiscal sponsor. So we are Beyond Plastics at Bennington College. Um, feel free to reach out uh, to me and there's our website. You can follow us on social media. Um, there's our handles and I'm gonna post that at the end of the presentation as well. So oh, what can you do about it? You know, these problems seem so David and Goliath that I just like to start out reminding everybody that um, you do have the power to change the world. Um, and uh, I use a few examples. Everybody I'm sure has heard of Greta Thunberg uh, by this point. She is a hero and a villain, depending on uh, who you are. <laughs> um, only 17 years old, uh, has been leading the um, Fridays for Climate school strike, basically started that in um, her native Sweden, where the students would strike uh, from school on Fridays with the argument that why should they go to school if they weren't going to have a future. So that was a student strike to demand accountability from government leaders who they felt were not taking action on climate change. And um, this has really resonated with youth around the world. And now we see the Sunrise Movement and many other youth-led movements. Um, but there are other climate leaders. This is Maria, Mariana, Cop Mariana, I believe is her full name, but Mari Copany, otherwise known as Little Miss Flint. She wrote, as an 11 year old, she wrote a letter to then President Obama, um, basically asking for help because uh, Flint's water was contaminated. And that is what sparked this whole uh, media movement on uh, focus on Flint. There's, this is uh, Shuteskat Martinez. He is the youth director of Earth Guardians. Um, he's an indigenous youth leader and he has spoken before the United Nations General Assembly in English, Spanish, and Nahuatl on the effects of fossil fuels on indigenous and marginalized communities. Um, so those are just a few examples of youth leaders. 
Um, here are some more. Um, these are all handles for um, Black and Indigenous people of color and queer people of color on Instagram or other social media platforms that are putting out content that I think is revolutionary in case you're interested in um, following these people. These are just a few that I follow um, and I would love to hear more from you as well. I um, get a lot of inspiration from these uh, young people. Um, and if you wanna take a picture of that slide, I'm just gonna ask folks before I start, if anybody here knows what plastics are made out of, you probably found out from oil. your yeah, it's oil. oil. Yes. Okay. Oil. Yes. But they're actually made out of something else um, too. Any ideas? Is it another fossil fuel like coal? It is another fossil fuel, but it's not natural. oil and it's not coal. Well, then the only thing that's really left is natural gas. Yes. So 99% of plastics are manufactured from fossil fuels, you're correct. Um, but the majority of plastics are actually manufactured from ethane, which is a byproduct of hydraulic fracturing. Um, hydraulic fracturing, if you didn't know, is a method of extracting shale grass from deep underground deposits. It has a high risk of contaminating drinking water, very obviously. Um, and this ethane is shown here as a flare. So fracking has boomed in the United States. There are more than a million wells now, up from 26,000 in uh, the year 2000. And this has led to a gas glut, meaning that there is more gas than domestic markets can absorb. So climate change and coronavirus are also impacting the gas market. So gas companies have too much gas, they can't sell it. So they're putting it into plastics manufacturing and that's providing a new uh, revenue source. Um, to frack a well, the company is gonna use millions of gallons of water mixed with chemicals and sand pumped deep underground, which fractures the bedrock so that the pockets of gas can be extracted. Then the slurry of water, chemicals, sand and gas comes back out of the well along with radon and naturally occurring radioactive isotopes from deep underground. It is from that slurry of materials that the ethane is separated along with wastewater, methane, butane, and um, propane. This is a still from the movie Gasland, um, which believe it or not was released in 2010. Um, and in that time, we better understand the impacts of fracking, but unfortunately not much has changed from a regulatory standpoint. Um, there are 1.7 million oil and gas wells in the US. Uh, many of them are abandoned and that is leading groups to call for fracking to be banned entirely or for there to be a moratorium on fracking because of its health and water impacts. The health damages of fracking are estimated to be 13 to $29 billion a year. Um, so I mentioned that the slurry that comes out with the ethane is radioactive. Um, that's just naturally occurring radioactive materials in the Earth's crust. Um, but that radioactivity accumulates in wastewater and the oil and gas equipment. So this is a screenshot from a, a groundbreaking article published in Rolling Stone by Justin Noble, who is writing a book on this topic. And if you haven't read this article, I really recommend it. This is a really hot topic, pun intended, in Ohio, where the wastewater that is radioactive, um, there is a push in the state Senate for it to be commodified, meaning it would be sold as a, sold as a commodity. Um, and it could be sprayed on roads, it could be sprayed on agricultural crops. There's really no um, telling what could happen with it. Um, and even now we don't really know where this waste is going. And I'm just, I know this doesn't seem like we're talking about plastics right now, but I just wanna ingrain in everybody that I talk to that this is a waste stream of plastics. Um, everything that has to do with fracking has to do with uh, plastics. Um, this is a screenshot from that article in the Rolling Stone. And this is a photo of an unlined fracking waste pit in uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And uh, it's not lined. It's just radioactive water sitting on the ground with a net over it to keep the birds off of it. Um, 
the ethane that is separated is transported with pipelines generally, um, and it's also transported overseas. So it is transported to uh, usually to Delaware. There's a port in Delaware uh, or New Jersey to be put onto massive ships and transported um, overseas to make plastics. The Mariner East 2 pipeline uh, goes all the way from Ohio to the Atlantic Ocean, and it's all to transport ethane to Scotland where it's going to be made into plastic. The sheer length of pipelines in the US continues to grow, contributing to the ongoing expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, really sadly, last week or maybe the week before, um, Enbridge uh, announced that line three was complete and that oil would begin flowing. More than 900 people were arrested protesting that pipeline um, that, float, that goes through Anishinaabe uh, indigenous territory in Minnesota. Um, and Enbridge is also trying to build a pipeline under Lake Michigan called Line 5. Um, there's also the Mountain Valley pipeline through Appalachia that's facing ongoing opposition. Though pipeline protests um, receive very little media attention uh, compared to other issues in the US today, which I think is a real problem uh, and the media should be critiqued for that. This is uh, Winona Leduc. She's a Anishinaabe indigenous leader who like many in indigenous peoples are largely unseen by corporate media. Um, she has dedicated her life to advocating for indigenous control of their homelands, natural resources and cultural practices. Um, she was arrested along with more than 900 people defending the Anishinaabe territory from line three. Um, and uh, she said in an interview with uh, Democracy Now uh, that uh, when she was arrested, Enbridge, the, which is a Canadian company that was building the pipeline, was paying the Minnesota police to arrest people in order to protect their pipeline. Uh, and ensure that it would be completed and that the Minnesota police wanted that contract with Enbridge to pay for weapons upgrades. Um, her interview with Amy Goodman is on YouTube. It's really um, interesting. Um, so after pipelines, the ethane that has been separated goes into the plastic supply chain. It may need to be stored before it goes to a plastic factory, which is called an ethane cracker. Um, gas liquids and the, the radioactive fracking wastewater are frequently stored in what's called injection wells. They are giant underground caverns that have been carved uh, from deep salt formations underground. They're usually not natural, though some of them are. There are approximately 180,000 class two oil and gas injection wells in the US. That's enough that if they were lined up from New York City to LA, there would be an injection well every 82 feet. And a single well can hold millions of gallons of gas or wastewater. I have a question, um, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, are those watertight, those injection wells, or do they just sort of leak everywhere? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the gas companies like to say they are watertight. Um, and that they are perfectly safe, but the real danger is at the wellhead. Um, they have a high risk of leaking and they are under intense pressure. Um, so there have been weeks, leaks at the wellhead and this can happen underground. Um, and there's also a risk that there may be abandoned wells or caverns or remnants of mining that, you, that the company doesn't know about before drilling the well and then the gas can leak there. And um, your question leads to this slide, which is a, a photo from an explosion that happened in Kansas in 2001. The gas was leaking at the wellhead underground um, unnoticed, and uh, it exploded over a radius of seven miles, uh, resulting in two fatalities. Um, the Ohio River Valley Institute, ORVI, uh, has done a lot of research on injection wells and knows a lot more than me. And I got this, um, I got this information from a presentation that they did. So if you want to learn more about injection wells, I would reach out to them. The other risk of injection wells is that they can cause sinkholes. Uh, this is a sinkhole that was um, caused by an injection well in 
Assumption Parish, Louisiana. It's 750 feet deep. Um, and basically the town was evacuated and were made ho homeless because of this uh, injection well that is still there today. So finally, um, we get to the ethane cracker. This is an actual plastics factory where the ethane gets turned into plastic and plastics manufacturing is rapidly expanding in the US. Um, let's see. Um, the ethane along with chemicals called plasticizers are manufactured into plastics here. The ethane goes through a series of chemical reactions to be turned into ethylene, which is then strung into polyethylene. Uh, the plasticizers or the chemicals, there are tens of thousands of chemicals that are added to plastic, give it its desirable characteristics and contribute to air pollution from these facilities. Um, the other issue with adding chemicals to plastics is that there is no chain of custody for the, for the chemicals once the plastics are on the market. So it poses a lot of um, issues when it comes to recycling because you don't know what's in the plastic that you are recycling with and whatever product it gets made into, um, which is a real concern if it's getting made into something that would be packaging food, for example. You don't want chemicals, toxic chemicals leaching into your food. Um, this is the ethane cracker in, Ohio, in the Ohio River Valley. It's in Beaver, Kensel Beaver County, Pennsylvania. It's the first such facility in the Appalachian region. So the Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia area. Um, but the American Chemistry Council projects that uh, this region could support up to five ethane crackers because of the Marcellus and Utica shale basins. Um, once completed, this facility will pump out 18 million tons of virgin polyethylene every year and virgin plastic production itself in the US is expected to quadruple by 2050 without regulatory in intervention. And that quadrupling means that more of these facilities are being built to capitalize on the cheap abundance of natural gas. The production of plastics obviously um, is not, doesn't smell like roses, it contributes to environmental injustice and environmental racism. The production uh, infrastructure is usually cited in low income and black, brown and, and indigenous communities, contributing to disproportionate health problems and a lower quality of life. The extraction and production of plastics also has major climate impacts, especially from methane emissions. Um, so another question, anybody have an idea what the um, climate impacts of plastics are, are comparable to? Probably, I'd say, uh, like, maybe agriculture? More. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh agriculture Would you believe and me if I said, what now? Agriculture and transportation? The emissions of plastics are greater than the entire African continent. They are equal with the emissions from Russia and twice that of the entire aviation industry. So about 1.7 gigatons from a study that came out in 2019 and it's likely higher today. Um, by comparison, the US puts out 5.4 gigatons of um, greenhouse gases every year. So, and we only have 4% of the world's population. Um, I think this goes without saying, this is another photo of an ethane cracker. Um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the international scientific community agrees that we have less than 10 years to avert the worst consequences of climate change. Um, this photo is a community group in St. James Parish, Louisiana called Rise St. James. Um, they are fighting, or I don't like to use the word fighting, but they are trying to stop um, a Taiwanese-based, Taiwan-based company called Formosa Plastics from building the largest plastics manufacturing plant in the U.S. in their 
um, their parish. Um, that plant would sit on 2,500 acres in an historically black community that is already affected by heavy industry, including Marathon and Bolero. And not only is the site, um, which is a former sugarcane plantation located on hundreds of acres of imperiled wetlands, um, but it contains the graves of people who were enslaved whose descendants are alive today and still live in that area. Um, this is a really common issue uh, in Cancer Alley because much of that area was former plantation and every plantation would have had a burial site. So it's unknown how many stories and ancestors have been um, lost from industrial sprawl. Um, but this is a photo of Rye St. James um, honoring those graves during a Juneteenth celebration. And the good news is that the Army Corps of Engineers um, recently declared that Formosa would have to issue an, a full environmental impact statement, which will delay the project for years and buy them a little more time to organize. So after the ethane goes through the um, plastic facility, the ethane cracker it gets turned into polyethylene, which looks like this. They are rice-sized pieces of plastic called nurdles, and these get turned into plastic bags and artificial turf and you know whatever is made out of polyethylene. Um, like your Coca-Cola bottle, for example. Um, nurdles in themselves are an environmental disaster. Um, they are spill everywhere that they are transported. They're basically glitter, which fun fact, glitter is also microplastics. Um, it's estimated that 250,000 tons of nurdles uh, leak into waterway each year just from plastic production facilities. So if you wanna learn more about the petrochemical expansion in the US, I really recommend reading this report, Fracking Endgame from Food and Water Watch. I love everything Food and Water Watch does. They are one of the most vocal groups out there calling for a ban on fracking. And they put out a lot of research on um, the expansion of fracking and petrochemicals in the US. So all this happens before um, plastic has reached your grocery shelf. And that's why I go through this whole spiel. Um, any idea from folks how much plastic there is in the world right now? It's probably equal, at least in mass, to the weight of all humans, I would imagine. Uh, more. Even though that's a weird like measurement, sorry. No, that's a great measurement. It's more though. Okay, so there's more, currently more than 8 billion tons of plastic uh, on Earth. That is all the plastic that has been produced since 1950. So that means that for every person on Earth, there is one ton of plastic. Um, so globally, nearly 400 million tons of virgin plastic are produced annually, and nearly half of that plastic is single use. So single use plastic is where we are focusing our organizing on. Um, less than 9% of plastic waste is recycled. And I hope people think about recycling differently after seeing um, how plastic is produced in the first place. And only 2% has been effectively recycled, meaning it wasn't eventually disposed of. It was, it was created into a product of equal value. Um, but it's estimated that a third of all this plastic waste has found its way into the environment. Um, and in the environment, it has huge impacts on wildlife, um, especially marine animals uh, that mistake it for food. And we are also ingesting plastics. We're ingesting about a credit card's worth of plastic every week, five grams. And um, a study just came out like a, a week ago or maybe two weeks ago that babies poop has twice as many microplastics as adults. Um, and we know that microplastics have been found in human placentas. So uh, plastics disproportionately harm babies and children and also the chemicals that are in plastic um, can act as endocrine disruptors. Um, PSA about bottled water, uh, another reason that we all need access to clean drinking water. And also a PSA about um, the chemicals that can be used to line food packaging, including fast food packaging. Uh, McDonald's has pledged that it will phase out PFOAs in their food packaging. 
Um, and it's really tough to know though what packaging has these chemicals in it and what doesn't because there's really no reporting requirements. You don't have to put it on the label, for example. And if it's recycled, then you don't know what's in it. But PFOAs are a forever chemical. They are a, a family of fluorinated chemicals or a class of fluorinated chemicals. They don't break down in nature and they, they bioaccumulate. So it's very concerning if it's in your food because once it's in your body, it, it doesn't really leave. This is the face of um, the American Chemistry Council or the face of plastics, as I like to say. Um, this is a screenshot from a press conference they held around the same time the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was introduced. Um, among many actions, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act comprehensively excludes chemical and advanced recycling from the legal definition of recycling. So this is a false solution that I really want everyone to pay attention to. It's really pertinent in uh, the state of Florida um, because your state has passed a law that would make it easier for chemical recycling and advanced recycling, I say recycling, it's not really recycling, to um, be uh, supported in your state legislatively. Um, so we know that uh, recycling of plastics has been a huge failure, sa very sadly, I'm sad to say. For other materials, it's great. For plastic, not so much. Um, some legal scholars actually argue that uh, recycling has been an illegal deception of the public and regulators, and now plastic makers are pushing what they call advanced or chemical recycling, which is actually really just turning plastic waste into fuel to be burned and not uh, true recycling. This is, it's a, it's a little hard to explain what chemical recycling is or advanced recycling is. But basically they argue that they can take plastic, break it back down into the monomers um, using heat and pressure and solvents. And from those monomers make new plastics, but um, it hasn't really worked outside of laboratory tests and it doesn't work on a commercial scale since uh, 2000, I believe. There have been 30 projects in the works and only three are in operation, according to the Global Alliance for uh, Incinerator Alternatives, which I got this slide from. They're also a great organization to follow. They're really on, in the know on chemical recycling. Um, other false solutions, um, mostly that have been pushed by the industry um, and industry NGOs and nonprofits that are disguised to be um, environmental advocates like Keep America Beautiful, um, blaming litter bugs, cleanups, um, exporting it out of sight, out of mind, voluntary pledges, pretty much anything that industry can do to avoid binding regulation on plastics and single use plastic bans. Um, but we need to do something about this. Uh, we actually need uh, to get this issue in front of as many people as possible and empower those people to take public action. Um, and so what the heck are we going to do and how are we going to do that? Um, so you are all students, but I hope you will start to think of yourself as organizers and I would encourage you to form a student organizing group on this issue um, if you can. We need to build the grassroots movement to really tackle this issue and um, first of all, eliminate single use plastics wherever and whenever possible and promote a, a true circular economy, which is um, reuse, refill, repair, remanufacture, all of those good things. Um, and all of that includes public action, uh, having a constituent meeting with your US representatives, if you know finding out who your congressional representative is or your mayor or whoever and asking for a constituent meeting with them and and not just talking to them about plastics but educating them on plastics you got to think of yourselves as educating everybody you can talk to on this issue that's part of getting the issue out there um, writing letters to the editor and op-eds this is really fun to do. A letter to the editor is really short, it's like 250 words, and you just look up the guidelines in your local paper and see what they ask for. And you can write um, a letter in support of a plastic ban, or I think in Florida, you have a preemptive bag ban, right? Yeah, you could write a letter to the editor about that or place an op-ed or get a resolution passed in your city government, in your um, student government, 
there's all kinds of things you can do once you start organizing. Um, here's one example of what student organizers have done. So SUNY New Paltz, the State University of New York, um, they formed an organizing group around plastics and they called themselves Beyond Plastics, which I thought was nice. Um, the, and these are what they accomplished. So they met twice, twice a month, every other week, and uh, they enlisted the help of the allies, like their sustainability officer, uh, the director of campus fulfillment services. Um, they found who they had to talk to and they were um, organized and diligent about it. So they took notes at the meetings, they utilized social media to reach out to their um, campus at large. They organized um, like art installations of plastic waste that they had picked up on campus. And um, they started with the single use plastic bags, getting those out of campus. Um, they got plastic bottles out of their vending machines and replaced them with the aluminum versions of those beverages. And um, they, not on this page, but they have been trying to get um, polyester out of the campus bookstore as well. California State University took it a step further. They have completely banned single use plastics um, and they did it by passing a one page policy, which you can download on our website, beyondplastics.org, or you can just Google California State University plastics policy and find it. You can just take that policy and take it to your school. I'm, I'm not sure how your school makes its decisions, but get that passed. And then that's, you know, cut right to the chase, more ban for the buck. Um, something that schools can do and maybe you could advocate for your school to offer is a course on plastic pollution. This is something that we do with Bennington College. We teach um, a seven week course. It's a comprehensive overview of the issue, but it's also got a strong focus on public action. Um, everyone is required to write a letter to the editor, for example, in that course, and it really empowers people to feel like they have the tools they need to uh, do something about this issue, and it turns people into organizers, and then I get to work with them, and it's really fun. Um, here are some uh, legislation that you can um, uh, lobby for if you're going to do grassroots lobbying, if you're going to meet with your senators, meet with your con congressional representatives. Um, Single-use plastic bans are great. New York State is enacting a full polystyrene ban in January, so polystyrene will be banned in the state. We also have a bag ban, and New York City just passed a ban on single-use plastic straws. The Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is the most comprehensive um, bill ever passed into Congress uh, on plastic waste. Um, the Unpolluter Welfare Act would address fossil fuel subsidies, um, fracking moratoriums. All, these are all interconnected issues. You can watch the story of plastic. You can organize a viewing party on the story of plastic. Um, this is a really great way to get people interested and involved in the issue. It's free to watch on YouTube uh, through November. It just won an Emmy for uh, documentary film writing. And it's also produced by uh, somebody who lives not too far from me, which I'm so tickled by. Um, but you can for, just have a viewing party with um, student organizing groups, student government, and get them a little more educated on the issue. Um, you can do a toxic tour um, if you can get a bus and you can get people on the bus, like uh, the mayor or faculty at your school or whoever is a decision maker and students and take them through your community and educate them about um, all the toxic uh, issues with plastic pollution in your area. And I'm gonna take you really quickly because I only have five minutes through um, a toxic tour of my area so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the Lafarge Holcomb Cement Plants in Ravina, New York. This is an international company in a town of about 2000 people in New York and it wants to burn millions of tires um, which are made of synthetic rubber and those are plastic and they wanna burn tires to replace coal in their kiln they would get paid to do this, and um, that would cause a lot of lead and mercury emissions. And they are right in the uh, Ravina School. They are literally 400 feet away from it. So this has caused a huge um, grassroots backlash against this company um, called the Queeman's Clean Air Coalition. They have been organizing for two years 
to um, block this. And it's been a epic struggle in that community. There is a a uh, company called BioHighTech that wants to build a trash processing plant in the city of Rensselaer. Um, basically, it would be a giant indoor landfill. They would separate out the plastic and the paper, shred it and sell it as fuel, but it would bring heavy truck traffic through this neighborhood. And it's also right on the Hudson River. And it's right next to the Rensselaer Public Housing Authority, which is the low income housing authority, low income housing neighborhood in that community. <sighs> Um, this is a photo of what it looks like when the plastic waste has been transformed into fossil fuels or back into fuel through chemical or advanced recycling. Um, we already know this, it's really toxic. I would say dioxins, um, which is what you get when you burn plastic and paper together is really, really toxic. It's the same ingredient in Agent Orange and you definitely do not wanna be breathing it. Oh, skipping ahead here. Uh, I like to include this one. This is a river, or this is a, the last riverfront forest in the city of Troy, New York. It's about 10 acres on the Hudson River, and it has um, indigenous artifacts on it from the Mohican and the Scaticoke people dating back 3,000 years. And a developer wants to clear cut this and build um, high rise apartments and a marina here, but that has caused, again, a grassroots movement which has successfully delayed the project at least for the last uh, year and a half and they're hoping to get it stopped so the power of grassroots organizing right where you are Dunn landfill um, this is a 99 acre landfill also in the city of Rensselaer that is right next to the Rensselaer junior senior high school um, so again the prevailing theme here is these facilities are located by vulnerable people children and low-income people this is a hazardous waste incinerator. It's in Cohoes, New York. I used to live one mile downwind of this incinerator. Um, and I took this photo in September of 2019. Uh, I used to drive by it every morning on my way to work. And the smog would be so horrible sometimes. I just would stop and take photos of it. The photo on the left is from uh, MLK Junior Day of uh, 20. 21, so just this year, they had a spill and that spill caught fire and resulted in an open burn. This facility is located 400 feet from the um, Cohoes Housing Authority. So again, the low income housing complex in this neighborhood, those are the smokestacks. There's 70 families live here. The thing about um, housing authorities and low income housing is that you don't get a choice where you live if you need that subsidized housing. If you deny, living there, you get shut out of the program, basically. So if they assign you an apartment there, you don't have a choice. Um, so this is an environmental justice issue that we've been organizing against. We've done a lot of events. In May, we had a sunflower planting um, for the community um, to get community awareness and also to have a healing um, event. This was inspired by Kathy Kelly, who is a an internationally renowned peace activist. Kathy Kelly was uh, arrested in the 1980s for planting corn on nuclear silos. Um, and she spent a year in prison for planting corn. So we planted the sunflowers and um, she's still doing peace activism. Um, you can also use memes. I love using memes to convey messages uh, about this issue. Uh, and I have a lot of memes if you need any. I also follow Reddit uh, slash r slash climate memes. Those are fun. Um, long story short, we can't recycle our way out of this problem or advanced recycle or chemically recycle our way out of this problem. We really need to stop producing um, single use plastics especially, but not produce as many plastics and create a circular economy and get ourselves off fossil fuels. Oh my goodness, I did it, 45 minutes. I hope you're still with me. Um, and happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. All right. Well, I'd just like to say, I think that was wonderful and you just pretty much reinforced to me how awful the whole world is. But uh, in regards to the plastic that's already out there, like I, I realize that making new plastic is bad, but is there any solutions of getting rid of plastic that's already just in the ecosystem of the world? Yeah, um, there are not solutions right now. Um, once it's in the ocean, it's going to stay there. Um, we really can't address it with cleanups, unfortunately. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a solution in the future. But first we have to turn off. It's like trying to bail out a bathtub with a teaspoon uh, if the faucet is still on full blast. So first we have to stop making so many plastics in the first place and then we can worry about cleanup more. Um, I do like to think that um, over time the, the earth will be able to heal if we can let it. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. I, I wish I had a better answer for that. Yeah, so just to reiterate, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourselves. I'll ask a question. Um, so there has been introduced in the uh, infrastructure package, and I think it's the uh, um, the one that would go through in reconciliation if it true, um, price on carbon. So Sheldon Whitehouse uh, from Rhode Island in particular has been pushing this. And the question is, how much would that affect plastic production? Um, I mean, obviously- Did you it say a tax it. on carbon? A tax on carbon, a price mm -hmm. on carbon, yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, I mean, obviously, ultimately, in fact, as soon as possible, we have to stop using fossil fuels entirely, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's bottom line, because mm -hmm. they're, they're creating problems, not just in plastic, but every other disastrous thing happening. So, I mean, is that a way that would affect plastics quickly, or would that be a long-term issue. I mean, it seems to me you have to do both yeah. sides, the production side and the use side, the consumerism side. Yeah. So I have heard both sides of the tax and I can only give you my personal opinion on the tax. And that is that a carbon tax um, would only enable um, polluters to basically pay their way out of uh, the problem and say that they're doing something about it, but it's not going to actually effectively reduce carbon emissions. Um, the thing about many of those facilities that I just showed you in that toxic tour is that um, those facilities like Norlight, for example, have had hundreds of thousands of dollars of fines levied against them by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation for violations to their permits. Um, and none of that has done anything to make those facilities operate any cleaner because it's just the cost of doing business for them. I think what would really have an impact is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act because that bill includes a moratorium on um, plastic production facilities, a moratorium on new federal permits for plastic production facilities. Um, so it would really curb that growth in an expansion that we need. Uh, the other thing about the reconciliation bill or the infrastructure bill, sorry, it's in the infrastructure bill is that it has $25 billion in subsidies for uh, petrochemicals and fossil fuels. That doesn't mean that money will get spent. It would be up to the Department of Energy and the other government agencies holding the purse strings, whether they actually spend the money. Um, but I think ending fossil fuel subsidies and passing the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act is um, what's most urgent legislatively. But that's, again, my personal opinion. There is a proposed um, virgin plastic tax, 20 cents per pound, that the industry is fighting all out against. Um, who knows? <laughs> There is a question in the chat that says, what do you think about, I believe it's uh, Singapore's waste program that eliminates all of their waste by incineration. I think they use that energy for power, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I haven't heard about this program, but if they're incinerating waste, then they are creating a public health issue because that those chemicals and the toxins and the plastic are just going into the air. Um, so, and having lived next to an incinerator for two and a half years, um, I would say incineration is not, we do not want to encourage incineration. 
Um, but using that, as far as using that energy for power, um, incineration uh, can sometimes be called waste to energy or waste to fuel. And that's just another word for incineration. Um, but what Singapore is probably dealing with is that they are a coastal country and they don't have a place for the plastic to actually go. And they're probably being flooded with um, single use sachets, which industry uses um, in Southeast Asia and other markets. And those sachets really um, can overwhelm the waste system. Um, I, I, they go into deep, great depth in that in the story of plastic. Uh, about that issue. Wonderful. Does anyone else have another question? I have a question, quick question. Um, so obviously a landfill, plastic going right into a landfill um, and leaching into the soils and, and groundwater and things like that is not ideal and neither is incineration. Um, but if you were to compare the two, what is the um, the difference in environmental impact between putting in uh, plastic in an incinerator versus a landfill? And is there one that's better than the other? Obviously, they're both bad, but. Yeah, they're both bad. Um, and it's really comparing to evils. Um, I don't want to say that landfilling is better than incineration, but I think the risk of incineration is that once you have an incinerator built, it, they are very, very difficult to shut down and they're very difficult. They undermine waste reduction efforts um, because often the incinerators actually have a contract with the municipality that the municipality will give X tons of waste every day for their operations. Um, and that can lead to them actually importing waste from other states if they can't meet that quota. Um, so that's the risk with uh, going with incineration. And the other thing about incineration is it actually doesn't eliminate the need for a landfill because for every three pounds of waste that you burn, you get one pound of ash, which is um, really concentrated toxic ash that has to be landfilled somewhere. Um, so it's both of them are just kicking the can down the road, really. But it's good to know where your waste is going. If I don't know where your waste is going, but you should maybe look into whether it's going to an incinerator or a landfill. Thank you. Um, if there's any other questions, we have time for maybe um, one more, but I thought that I would come to speak a little bit about that UNF, um, here at UNF, we're trying to start a plastics, um, single banning or phasing out um, single use plastics initiative. And that's really gonna kind of come together and start on uh, that event on October 25th. Um, and you guys will have the opportunity as students to come and give your feedback on what actions you'd like to see um, taken on our campus and also uh, signing in a student pledge against plastic. So if you're interested in that, if you could go ahead and put your, um, send me, private message me your email, and I'll go ahead and make sure you're on the list to receive that information. And then if that I can also send that information over to Beyond Plastics, if you're interested in receiving more um, updates and information from them. And thank you so much, Alexis. We learned, I learned so much um, that I didn't even know. I feel like every time I come to these things, I learn just more. It's usually more bad things, but it's good to, um, it's good to know. Yeah, you're incredibly knowledgeable about this. And uh, I kind of enjoy hearing the, how the world is coming to an end for, you know, perverted reason, but you know. All right, bye-bye. I would say um, the world is not coming to an end. The world will be fine, even if humans are not. <laughs> um, but um, it's hard. Anxiety is a real problem right now. And um, I encourage everyone to find something that they can do to heal, um, both heal yourselves and heal um, other people and heal nature and the planet, because healing energy is really going to be a necessary part of um anything to do to to make this problem less
problematic. <laughs> um, so I hope that doesn't sound too woo woo, but um, healing is very important. And one last thing I've put into the chat, the links to the Beyond Plastics website, if you'd like to learn more, um, and also the link to the Institute's um, plastic website. So you can visit that um, to find out about the events coming up and find Zoom links and resources and information. And Alexis has put her email in the chat too, if you'd like to reach out to her. Um, but thank you so much, Alexis, for speaking with us. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Erin. Thank you.